Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. Has anybody got any uh, problems with their hearing at all? Uh, yep. Uh, so what volume wise or hyperacusis or? Uh, I've lost a bit here in my ear. Okay, right. Is anybody uh, sensitive to sort of certain frequencies or um, if people cheer and clap and stuff like that, do they have a problem with that from a sort of sensitivity point of view? No? Yeah, you do. Only a few frequencies. But okay. Not, not that big. Okay, all right, cool. So if everybody gave me a massive round of applause, you wouldn't have a problem with that. <laughs> okay. Just checking, because I didn't check, check last time. Yeah, sorry, being very narcissistic. But you, you'll see why in a moment. Anyway, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John O'Neill. I'm a director at ACS, um, Customer Hearing Protection and In-Ear -in -in Monitors. You may be aware of the brand, um, but we've become the music industry standard in custom hearing protection especially. Uh, but we also do make custom molded earphones or in-ear monitors, which you probably see a lot of artists wearing, um, especially contemporary popular musicians, rock and pop musicians wearing on stage for their monitor mix. So we, we, we make those. But very much hearing conservation uh, and awareness of this subject is, is very important to us. And it's firmly embedded into the ethos of the company, partly because uh, of my background, but also my boss who started the company 25 years ago this year uh, was a professional musician, suffered an acoustic shock to his hearing and then had um, hyperacusis, which is sensitivity to certain frequencies because of the damage to the sensory hair cells in the cochlea and also then had uh, chronic tinnitus and still has chronic tinnitus. So, um, and there wasn't any hearing protection on the market at the time for musicians. Um, it was very much kind of like foam earplugs or cotton wool or toilet paper um, or sticking your fingers in your ears. So he decided to, to start uh, a company and he, he introduced the first musician's earplug to the market which was the ER15, a 15 decibel attenuating custom moulded earplug. So there we are. So it's firmly embedded into our uh, company ethos. And plus, um, we, with various partners from the British Tinnitus Association to help Musicians UK and Harley Street Hearing, who we're partners with the uh, Musicians Hearing Health Scheme for professional musicians and those working in the music industry. Um, we work with those as a manufacturer, but also um, supporting these organisations to raise awareness about hearing conservation to the next generation of music makers, which we feel is very important. And also we're members of various institutions and associations, including the Hearing Conservation Association, which is a new association, uh, British Safety Industries Federation, and the uh, Incorporated Society of Musicians, amongst a few others. So, uh, so yeah. So, ACS, yeah, we're a manufacturer. And, and just before you think that, oh, our sun sales guy to come to tell us about earplugs. Um, well, yes, that's right, you're right. <laughs> But also that um, my background, just be a bit self-indulgent for a moment. I've kind of been there, done it, done, got the T-shirt. Really, my background is as a professional musician um, and went through the music education system myself, O-level o music, that's how old I am, A-level music, did a degree at City uh, and was fortunate enough to work for 15 years as a professional musician, including two years at the BBC. However, in my mid to late 30s, I realised that uh, I had chronic tinnitus and, uh, and music-induced hearing loss, uh, which was a bit of a problem and had an impact on my life both professionally and personally, so much so that I gave up playing for a while as, as well and thought I might have to go and get a proper job. So, um, so yeah, but, um, so I became very angry about this when I realised that I damaged my hearing because going through music education and loving music, you know, even as a kid from a young age wanting to play the drums, um, and then at school playing drums and in the orchestra and then, and then at, at university and then professionally, although as a bass player professionally I couldn't get any work as a drummer. <laughs> but um, felt, a bit, felt angry that nobody told me that I could be damaging my hearing and when I did get involved in teaching in further education I, I did ask the management what they were doing about raising awareness about hearing conservation to the next generation of music makers and they were like, what are you talking about? It's like, well, in, in other 
vocational training and education, you would you would in sports science you talk about you know how the body works and how to look after it and uh, hair and beauty, health and safety, sports science, even um, musculoskeletal screening for for people that are doing dance and drama. So what are we doing for musicians? And I found that really a lot of times in music education the subject of occupational health and safety and hearing conservation especially is, is not really talked about. So I was on a mission ever since then to, to, to try and raise awareness so uh, people like you guys don't end up like me. So I retired from playing, although I did come out of retirement last summer, this summer, just gone, yeah it was. And um, a little bit jammy because I ended up playing with an artist at, at Glastonbury, which was nice. But I was wearing hearing protection, so there we are. So yeah, but for fun now, They're all, all good fun. So yeah. So imagine having a ringing in your head all the time. Has anybody uh, had this at all, temporary, or, or do you have it? Do you have it chronic? Is it temporary? Temporary. Okay. Some people have had this. Yeah. You might have experienced this. Come out of a nightclub or from a gig or whatever ringing in your head. It's a perceived sound, it's not a real sound. Or, and when that damage becomes more, it becomes worse, um, not being able to hear music properly in conversations with friends, which is what happened to me. Um, I realised I couldn't, in certain social situations, not hearing, more so female voices and children, I couldn't quite hear what people were saying. <clears throat> Consonant sounds, f th 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 sounds, so I was missing, missing out on conversations, uh, although I was told that I had selective hearing, but uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't the case. And then I had a, I had a hearing test, and um, yeah, there, there it was, it was a bit of a shock for me. It was, and the audiologist said, yes, Mr. Heal, classic noise-induced hearing loss, have you worked in the aircraft industry? And I said, no, I've worked in music. And he said, well, why didn't you wear any earplugs? And I was like, oh, yeah. earplugs? I want to hear the music. You know, I don't want to block it out. I want to hear what's going on. And my experience of earplugs, hearing protection before that, was probably a bad one. Again, toilet paper, foam earplugs. Anyway, once the damage has been done, it's done. It's irreversible. But in terms of music-induced tinnitus and hearing loss, all of this is 100% preventable. But making music and health and safety may not see, you know, see that the two are connected. But you know, uh, as I said, in in in, um, in other areas, uh, in industry, uh, and in other areas of the creative arts industry as well, that people take occupational health and safety quite quite seriously. Things are changing, um, and and it's lovely to see that Royal Northern uh, are making a lot of changes here, and uh, and really seen as you know, delivering best practice in this area for sure. I think there's been a change in culture as well, especially in the electronic dance music industry um, with regards to hearing conservation, possibly because more young people are damaging their hearing from expo exposure to dance music, be mainly because of long periods of time and, um, and the levels are very high uh, and the dynamics don't change. So, um, yeah, for sure. And it's a growth industry for us. And it's very sad for me as a parent and as a professional to, to talk to a lot of young people your age that have already damaged their hearing and got hearing as bad as I have. And I'm 52. So, yeah, it's a growth industry for us. And, and now I, I have an agent in Ibiza for six months of the year, um, which is, of course, I have to go out there just to make sure everything's all right. Um, but, yeah, both from people that work in the industry there, but also as uh, club goers as well. So the culture is changing for sure, and doing these presentations, and I've been coming to the Royal Northern now for ooh, five years maybe, talking to young musicians, and I think you guys are more aware of this, which is fantastic. So a few scary facts, World Health Organization, they've been banging on about this for, for a long time, how they got this information, how they measured it, I don't know, but it must be true, right, but more, more so in terms of young people being exposed to amplified music and sounds, um, that 40% of that 1.1 billion young people at risk from hearing loss um, are exposed to potentially damaging levels of sound at entertainment venues. So of course you guys love music, you're making music, listening to a lot of music, so you are more at risk. Uh, and there has been other research in education, George Odom, who was a real trailblazer in this um, over the last 20 years, um, he did a pilot study 
into the hearing health of, of music students and found that 26% of students in his survey claimed they had tinnitus um, and 17% of them from audiometric testing, so that's hearing tests, had some degree of hearing loss. Uh, now, how much of that was connected to the music making process and how much of that was connected to, you know, or part of social and recreational listening as young people, um, I don't know, but it, it, seriousness, the statistics obviously needs more professional investigation for sure. Uh, and then a research that was done with Help Musicians and the Musicians Union shows that as a musician you're 3.5 times more likely to suffer from music induced hearing loss and almost 1.5 times more likely to develop tinnitus than the general population. So you love music, you listen to a lot of music. Earphones, going out, listening to music, socially, clubs, pubs, bars, and then making music, rehearsing in the studio, rehearsals, uh, performances, gigs, etc, etc. So you are more at risk, your generation in general, and as a musician. Yeah, hearing conservation and health and safety for musicians is not mandatory as a subject in music education. Uh, it's changing in HE, and as I said, the Royal Northern are really leading the way in this area. But it, it, uh, nothing. St my, my daughter started to learn to play the drums, and even her first drum lesson. So, let, so we're 40 years on from me being at school learning to play a musical instrument, and it was drum kit. Um, and the first drum lesson, she wasn't told anything about maybe that you should wear earplugs if you're practicing the drums for long periods of time. How mad is that? So how mad is that and how angry that was that um, I did a media campaign earlier this year for World Hearing Day and I took my daughter on the BBC and we talked about it and go, there you go, I've damaged my hearing, what are we doing in education, what's going on? Um, and of course parents' evening was quite good, uh, that term uh, when I sort of addressed it with a music teacher. And oh yeah, you ended up on the telly talking about it, yeah, so what are you doing about your teachers, you know, your peripatetic teachers talking, you know, protecting my child or just raising awareness. Anyway, there we are. Yeah, why not? And yeah, your generation, you know, we're, we're, we're exposed to more noise and stuff than, uh, than ever before in the history of the human race. What's the loudest thing in nature you'd come across? A wild animal or something or a volcano. But you wouldn't necessarily hang around to listen to it, would you? You'd probably run away incite your reptilian part of your brain um, and activate your fight or, fight or flight mechanisms for sure. So, musicians, first year at Royal Northern College of Music, what is sound? Oh dear. <laughs> really? Sorry? Vibrations, yeah, vibrations in Porridge. <laughs> yeah, we're in air, yeah. They're in a gas, vibrations in a gas. Just quickly, because I'm very interested to know, asking, I've done this presentation to hundreds of young musicians, what is music? What do you, th what, how, what do you consider music? Vibrations. <laughs> what, what was that? Good vibrations. Good vibrations. <laughs> yeah. Organised organized sound, even even crazy, you know, spontaneous jazz or electroacoustic music is organised in, in some way. So, yeah, I'm just interested. The, be the best one for me was, um, I asked this question and uh, a young lad put his hand up and said, Sir, for me, music, music's love. So, <laughs> I thought that was quite nice. And that's, <clears throat> and it is very special, isn't it? Music is the love of our life. That's why we're here, right? So, um, you know, any other subject area, but I think in the creative arts, to, to, to have a love for an art form and, and want to do it professionally, hopefully that's why you guys are here, yeah? Um, it's something very, very special and, and you should, should treasure that and, uh, and also, yeah, look after, your, look after your ears. So how, how is it measured? Well, there's two things. Sound is measured, um, the amplitude or the loudness and then the frequency, yeah, cycles per second, so how many vibrations per, per second. So the, the, the more vibrations per second, the higher the frequency, and then, um, and then obviously the, the, the longer the waveform, the less cycles per second, the lower the frequency. 
So the amplitude is me measured in decibels, so sound pressure. It's a logarithmic measurement of sound pressure. Um, decibels, they call it decibels. It could be bananas, really, but um, something to, to remember is it is logarithmic. It's not a linear measurement. So an increase in three decibels is twice the sound pressure intensity, or it's twice as loud. Okay, so remember that. We'll come back to that in a, in a bit. So this is, this is the ear. This is the pinna. Um, uh, this is where our journey into sound really starts. It's a funnel. Um, it's a sound catcher, really, for those vibrations in, in, in a gas, in, in air. Um, it's made of cartilage, and then that cartilage goes all the way down the ear canal up to the second bend in the auditory canal, just where it goes through the hole in your skull. And it continues to grow and change shape for your entire life, ladies and gentlemen. There we are. Um, some people think that gentlemen's ears grow more than ladies' ears. You do see guys with massive ears, don't you? Older, older guys. And again, that's nothing to do to compensate for selective hearing either. But uh, there's no scientific evidence um, to, to, uh, to, to that effect. But anyway, yeah, it does continue to grow and shape, change shape. And your ears are unique in every way. They're almost as unique as your fingerprint. Um, shape and size, everybody's ears are different. The shape of the ear canal, even left and right, we're not symmetrical. So just a little whistle-stop tour, really, of the ear. So those vibrations go down the ear canal, the auditory canal, uh, which has ear earwax in, ladies and gentlemen. It's there for a reason. It's a natural secretion. It's there to pick up the dead skin and dust from the orifice. It's an orifice, and it's a conveyor system to collect all of that. Plus, it's very acidic and stops things crawling, uh, crawling down your ear canal. Those vibrations hit the eardrum or tympanic membrane. It's like a membrane of skin, like the skin of a drum, hence its name, tympanic, as in a, a tympany. And that vibrates with those vibrations, very delicate. Activates a three-bone lever system, which actually increases the amplitude of those vibrations and transfers those to a plunger at the end there, which actually goes in and out and creates those vibrations into a fluid medium in the cochlea, in the inner ear, which we'll come on to in a, in a moment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, one person. So, uh, fairly stable system, but the, the middle ear there um, has a tube there. You see the eustachian tube, this tube here. It's connected to the, uh, the back of the nasal passage. It's there for two reasons, to help draining of any fluid um, in the middle ear chamber, but also to equalise the air pressure from the outside world to, to uh, the middle ear chamber. So if you... Um, come down in an aeroplane or come down a mountain, you know, your ears go a bit all blocked and then you swallow or blow gently or any of you that do diving, scuba diving, you have to equalise the air pressure in your, in your ears. Um, sometimes though, if you get a, a cold or an infection, um, the eustachian tube can become inflamed, you get a build-up of fluid um, and you, you feel all blocked up, that's what's going on. Then sometimes you blow your nose or equalise your ears and your ears pop. That's, that's what's happening, where that air is equalising from the outside to the middle ear chamber there. Other than that, it's a fairly stable system. Sticking things in your ears, not a good idea. Cotton, cotton wool buds, we all do it, shouldn't endorse it. But um, yeah, I think there are quite a lot of accidents every year of people pushing it too far and perforating the eardrum. Yeah, Ooh, it does feel good though. Anyway, but not, not, perforate, not perforate your eardrum, I'm talking about cleaning your ears. Very satisfying. Yeah, no, I'm not endorsing using earbuds. Yeah, uh, edit that off of this uh, video. Yeah. Um, the old saying is you shouldn't stick anything bigger than your elbow in your ear. There we are. It's a bit bonkers, isn't it? But anyway, um, so this is where it's really happening. So those vibrations are transferred into the, the cochlea, that snail-like organ which is a tube, it's actually two tubes filled with fluid and running through the centre of it is a, is a membrane with just under 16,000 sensory hair cells like blades of grass moving in that fluid and as those vibrations pass over those sensory hair cells it disturbs them, causes a nerve impulse through the cochlear nerve, through the auditory nerve to the auditory cortex of the brain and that's how you hear so in actual fact you hear with your brain, not your ear. Your ear is a mechanism of transferring vibrations in a gas into a nerve impulse. Pretty amazing, right? You can't really, couldn't really make it up. So, 
They, imagine a piano keyboard, but the other way round, so high frequencies at the left end and the low frequencies at the other end. So as those vibrations go across, they excite different sensory hair cells at different frequencies. Okay, So from about 20 kilohertz to about 20 hertz in terms of cycles per second. So we're very susceptible to high frequencies and mid frequencies for various reasons, partly because the sensory hair cells are at the front of the cochlea, but also the resonant frequency of the auditory canal is around two kilohertz, which, strangely enough, is the mid, midway or mid bandwidth of the, the sounds or the, the, the bandwidth of the human voice. So there we are, we've evolved to be more susceptible to hearing those sounds, possibly because of our, you know, hearing our children, our offspring, uh, and communication in some way, shape or form. Um, and also in our language system, consonant sounds are very important to us and they sit more so in those mid to high frequencies from about two kilohertz up, upwards, two to sort of eight kilohertz. F, th, s, k sounds all sit in that bandwidth as well. So very important to us humans. Um, so yeah. So when, how are those sensory hair cells damaged? Well, when the sound level is very high, the amplitude is very high, so are the vibrations in the fluid, and it flattens down those sensory hair cells, yeah? Uh, and when the sound goes away, after about 12 hours, 24 hours, those sensory hair cells stand, stand, back, up again, stand back up again. However, when you keep getting exposed to loud noise or loud sound or music, um, after a period of time, they, they get a bit fed up with it and they die off. Well, they don't think that, obviously. They don't actually, well, I'm a bit fed up and I'll die off. But, but they, they do die off and it's, uh, that's it. Once they die off, that's it. Okay, they don't grow back. Okay, they're not like grass. They don't grow back. So, yeah. It's a damage to the sensory receptors in the cochlea. That's where it's all going on. So, what is the damage? Well, if you ever come out from a... Um, musical event or a bar or a nightclub and your hearing's gone muffled. A show of hands? Yeah, pretty much nearly all of you, yeah. They call that temporary threshold shift. So that's when those sensory hair cells are being flattened down. You can't hear properly, you're all shouting at each other. Should we go and get a kebab? <laughs> oh, I love you! <laughs> you're shouting at each other. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. it's funny when you haven't got temporary threshold shift and you're dealing with people with it and everybody's shouting at each other. Um, or a ringing in your ears, or whistling in your ears. Has anybody had that on a temporary basis? Yeah, okay. So, so that, is a kind of, that is a warning sign, really, for your ears going, oh, it's too, being too loud. Similar to if you, if you accidentally, don't obviously do this, but if you look at the sun and you get dots in front of your eyes or look at a spotlight like I've just done now, and, and now I can't see anything. Um, it's, you know, it's like it's a warning signal, it's similar to, to that. So obviously this can become permanent, so chronic tinnitus. Uh, and when it doesn't go away, and I was actually on holiday when it happened to me, because I was normally after gigs or whatever, it would go away the next day. Uh, and then I remember it didn't go away, and I thought, oh, that's funny, it's normally the ringing's gone away, and then the next day it's still there, and then two weeks later it's still there, it's like, whoa, something, there's something not right now which was what was very scary. And then, of course, when that affects your hearing, they call it noise-induced hearing loss, uh, and the term in the industry, music-induced hearing loss, is, is, is very common and accepted as the term for that. And that's permanent, that's it. Yeah. How many of you had a hearing test? Not a few? Okay, good. Okay, well, look, this is one of the most important assets you have as a musician, so get a hearing test. It's, as regular as getting your eyes tested, yeah. You can get it done for free, spec savers, boots hearing care, go to your GP, get your hearing test, and monitor your hearing. Okay, normal hearing is plotted like this, 125 hertz to about eight kilohertz. They play you a sine wave tone, and then they, they reduce the volume, and then they plot the threshold of where you can't hear that, that, that tone or that note any, anymore. And this is decibel loss here or reduction. So that's actually quite a lot, obviously, considering it's a logarithmic measurement of sound pressure. So normal hearing, you're hearing audio. This is called an audiogram. It should look like this. Zero loss. Might wiggle a little bit, but it should be fairly, fairly flat. 
noise induced, you will see that damage start to happen around two kilohertz, more so really a drop at four kilohertz. And with musicians, you do normally see that dip at the four kilohertz kind of like notch. They're classic, uh, really. Most people I know that have got damaged, uh, me included, will, will have that notch. So there you go, that's my, my audiogram there. So classic music induced hearing loss. That dip at four kilohertz, more so with my, my left ear. Possibly, well I know, that I worked stage right, this side, uh, quite a lot, and standing next to a drummer who was here. So obviously cymbals, hi-hats, snare drums, all that sort of thing, very loud, impact sounds, very loud, in that bandwidth as well, so that's where that damage has occurred. So yeah, it's a bit of a problem for me, especially in social situations. Um, and when I tried hearing aids, uh, digital hearing aids that profiled to that, it was, it was a mad experience. I don't need them all the time, but in social situations they're great. But it, it, it was, oh, it was mad because it's suddenly you, you're really aware of all these frequencies that you don't normally hear, like, like doing this or putting a coat on all the rustling. Um, and you can hear everybody. It's a bit overwhelming, actually, because normally I've trained myself to focus on what people are saying. And then suddenly at dinner parties or in the pub, you're like, whoa, hang on a minute. <laughs> There's a multitude of conversations going on. Yeah, it's pretty mad. Uh, that's a DJ friend of mine. He, he now has hearing aids. Any loss like this, you're looking at hearing aid territory, really. Um, and some old musicians, obviously, that's also the case as well. So, how do you, if you know your risk? Well, if you have to shout at somebody about two metres away, uh, it's going to be pretty much too loud. So, in social situations, be aware of that. Warning signs, the ringing, that dullness, that muffledness, uh, usually suggests that you've been in a very loud environment and you may be temporarily damaged the sense of your hair cells. Or you can carry a sound pressure meter around with you. <laughs> You know, which you kind of you're not going to do. Oh, hang on a minute, can't go in there. Let me just have a look. Oh no, too loud. Yeah. Um, but you can download apps on your phone. Get some good ones. You wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily um, you wouldn't necessarily do a formal noise assessment. But there's some there's some good ones that you can download on from the app store that have kind of a little traffic light system and a little little thing here, but they're, they're pretty good to get an, uh, an idea of environments. Download one, go out for a night out and just leave it on the table and see how loud it is. You may be surprised. Now, this brings me nicely on to, you've probably, you've probably been thinking, what is this? Um, well, it's called a sound ear, okay? It's a, a sound pressure uh, level, or it's a dB meter, it's a sound pressure, it's a volume mm -hmm. measurer. Measurer. Um, it's, it's a dB meter, basically, um, but it has this graphic display on it to tell you uh, when it gets too loud. So you can see the de decibel. This one actually isn't officially calibrated yet, but you will see these in the, the uh, rehearsal environments. You, some of you may have already seen one of these kicking about. Uh, don't kick them about. They're very expensive. <laughs> They'll be mounted on the wall, but it'll give you an idea of the sound level in that environment. Very accurate uh, when they're calibrated. It gives you the decibel level here, um, but also this sort of traffic light system, um, green, orange, red. Obviously, when it's red, it's obviously it's, it's over 85 decibels. I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, so you should be aware of your exposure time. So we're going to do a little experiment, and this is where the, the round of applause thing comes in, is just to, because people say, well, how loud is 90 decibels? How loud is 85 decibels? You know, I, I, I kind of get the frequency thing, because I know with my perfect pitch or whatever, not I have, that that's that note and it's that frequency and, you know, whatever. Um, or just drop a little bit 2K out of my monitors or whatever. But, but in terms of sound pressure level, it's, uh, you know, what... what it's very difficult for us to determine what, how loud is it, do you know what I mean? Is it too loud? Unless you get those warning signs, which is usually after you've been in the environment. So we're just going to do a little experiment here um, on my little tour around the country. I've just been um, uh, taking sound pressure levels um, of the applause uh, from my presentation. I haven't finished, but just for three seconds, if that's okay, I just want you to maybe just give a round of applause you can scream, cheer, 
wave your hands in the air like you just don't care, whatever. Um, and let's just see how loud it is, okay? Is that, is that cool with everybody before we do it? Yeah, are you cool with this as well? Great, okay. So after three, one, two, three. Okay. <laughs> what did that go up to there? Did you see? No, it didn't, didn't set, but anyone hear it? That was 111 decibels. Um, but an LEQ, um, an LEQ, which is a, an average sound pressure level, over was 92. So yeah, so it's quite, and that was just over a short period of time. So yeah. Um, there we are. In actual fact, uh, a guy that now works for us, Fred Jackson. Um, American sound engineer used to work with Bruce, Bruce Springsteen. He, he actually has hyperacusis and tinnitus, and he reckons that his hearing damage has been caused by screaming women. Yeah. Um, being in the front of house position at these big, like, you know, 40,000, 80,000 uh, arena things with screaming women, screaming, you know, ah, oh, Bruce. And he reckons that's how he's damaged his hearing. So that's pretty cool, right? Well, I don't know. You know, my hearing's been damaged by screaming women. Oh, really? What have you been doing to them? <laughs> so here's some examples then to have a look at in terms of decibel levels. So a, a chamber ensemble, small mezzo forte. What do you reckon? What do you reckon? How loud? These are examples. Very broad. Just have a guess. Six. A little bit louder, maybe. maybe 80, 85. Again, it depends on the repertoire and the environment. Symphony orchestra, really going for it. Yeah, it can be, can be quite loud. Bagpipes and drums. <laughs> higher, higher, yeah. It's like a game show, isn't it? I put this in because I, I, I've done lectures at the National Bagpipe Trust in Glasgow. Um, has anybody played the bagpipes? They're loud, right? They're designed for being played on a mountain, right? not in a village hall. Okay. Yeah, we've got a lot, lot of deaf bagpipe and drum players, you know. We sell a lot of earplugs to them. Yeah, but yeah, very loud. Amplified rock bands, I don't know if any of you work, but I mean, backline levels, the thing is with an acoustic drum kit, you're probably looking at sound pressure levels between about 94 to 97 decibels for starters, and then you've got all the amplification, backlines we call it, bass guitar, guitar amps, fold back monitors, speakers, wedges. So you, you, you're probably looking at you know, mid to upper 90s for, for starters. And then front of house, at amplified music events, you're probably looking at 97 decibels. Um, partly because that you, hey, I'm not saying I don't like loud music and you shouldn't listen to loud music. We like, you know, loud music, when you're moving that amount of air pressure, it moves, especially for the bass frequencies, it makes us want to move, makes us want to dance, right, through bone induction. And you need the sound pressure levels at least 95, 97 to kind of like cause that. You need to be moving that amount of air. Oh man, I can really feel the bass, you know, fantastic. However, when you've got sound pressure levels that are loud, that obviously that's the same sound pressure levels in the mids and high frequencies as well, which you're more susceptible to damage, which I've showed you earlier. Bit of a problem. So this is the most important thing I'm going to tell you uh, this afternoon. So if you don't remember anything else, try and remember this. It is really about your the, the sound level or the, the, the volume compared to your exposure time. Yeah? Okay, really important. So at 85 decibels, your safe exposure time is eight hours. Now, it's a logarithmic measurement of sound pressure, so for every three dB increase in sound pressure, it's doubled, so it's twice as loud. So if it's twice as loud, you should half your exposure time, yeah? So you've gone from eight hours to four hours, 85 to 88, 88 to 91, two hours. So when you get up to that 94, 97 dB, you're looking at like one hour, 30 minutes, yeah, 30 minutes to an hour, so not long. So when you're in social situations with loud music, it will be in excess of probably 100 decibels. So it's 15 minutes. So yeah, which is fine. 
But as a musician, so you're doing that, going to doing that, and then the next day you're in rehearsals, you're in the studio, you're listening to music on your earphones. So all of this adds up to this battering, if you like, that your ears are getting. So just be aware of that, especially, I do say this to musicians, you know, it's not just about the gigs and the rehearsals, it's your social and recreational listening habits as well, for sure. So the management of noise in the industry has changed and we've, we're doing an awful lot more. Um, but the hierarchy of control in other industries doesn't really work for the music industry because normally if you have a hazard like noise or loud sound that can damage your hearing, cause you harm or, you know, or permanently damaging, damage one of your senses, normally this is the hierarchy that they would apply. So, well, it's a hazard, we need to eliminate it. Well, you can't turn it off. You can't stop it, you've got no music, have you? you know I mean? Turn it down, maybe, but acoustic instruments are what they are, you have the dynamics, amplified music needs to be a certain level to you know, project, and you're working with certain instruments that you know, are that loud anyway. So, when you get down to using any sort of personal protective equipment, like earplugs, it's usually very low on hierarchy, but in the, in the music industry, the paradox is it's really the other way around because you can't do any of these other things, which is why you need good quality earplugs. Okay, uh, and also, as I've said, listening to music on earphones. Yeah, just be aware, guys. You know, we all who listens to music on earphones? <laughs> That's a stupid question, really, in the 21st century. But you've all, you know, these earphones uh, that are universal fit earphones not going to fit your ears pro properly, so you're not going to get everybody's ears different shapes, so you're not going to get that seal integrity, which means that you're probably going to get some leakage of your, your background exposure. And th this is fact that you probably noise your environments when you're out and about. The sound levels will probably be about 10 decibels above background um, to, to hear the music, okay? So if you're in an environment where um, it's 85 decibels to hear the music, you probably will be turning up to 95 decibels, right? So work that back. So you've gone from eight hours to what? A couple of hours, one to two hours. So just be aware of that. So where good, I don't know why I put beats up there. I need to change that, I say it every time, don't I? Um, but wearing sort of closed cup headphones or custom made earphones are better because you get that isolation. So you don't have to have it so loud. Plus these are rubbish, they're cheap dynamic cone, uh, dynamic uh, speakers and when you turn them up you get more harmonic distortion which is a bit more of a problem as well. So the solution, awareness, education and protection. Simple. So awareness, yeah I think the industry is changing and education wise you know a lot more is being done uh, in higher education especially and that's why I'm here. But Royal Northern are really leading the way in this. Um, but when I started my mission, I had, I had nobody on this screen. Now I can't fit them all on. They're, they're doing something, at least. They're trying to raise awareness or they're giving hearing protection to, to musicians, which is fantastic. Excuse me. So uh, who, who wears earplugs um, for anything? Sleeping, riding a motorbike or anything? Yeah, not many. How many wear them for music? Mm. Okay, fair enough. Okay, well not, not all earplugs are the same. So when we say earplugs, this is the changing culture that we need. People think, oh, blocks it all out. Earplugs, well, yeah, it plugs your ears. But foam earplugs are no good for listening to music. They're an auditory block, and they're not suitable or fit for purpose. Um, however, if you don't hear the music, absolutely happy days all day long. The problem with foam earplugs is that you will lose a lot, especially more so a loud of loud sound levels, you will lose more mid and high frequency, which will affect the fidelity of the sound and the clarity of the sound that you're hearing. Uh, but bone induction, again, loud sound pressure levels, the bass frequency through bone induction through your head will still excite the tympanic membrane and the fluid in the cochlea as well, so just be aware of that. Um, yeah. So hearing protection, hearing protection for musicians Something you need to remember, very important, is you need high fidelity attenuating hearing protection, or I call it ambient hearing protection, so you can still obviously hear your sort of ambient surround. You don't want to block it out. Two types, generic fit, off the shelf, ready to go, universal fit that will fit pretty much anybody. Um, and these have an attenuating filter in them that turn it down various systems. Um, 
go through in a minute, or custom fit where they're bespoke made for your ears only. With our hearing protection, we, we have a, uh, this is with our universal fit and our custom molded earplugs, we have a membrane technology, so it's a filter that turns the music down. There we are, so it, uh, yeah, if it turns it down, it increases your exposure time. E easy. Plus the air can move both ways, helps to ventilate the ear, um, so you don't get hot and sweaty, and also um, helps to compensate for the occlusion effect. How many vocalists we got in the here? Yeah, okay. Now if you're wearing earplugs or sticking your fingers in your ears, you, you hear your voice. It's called the occlusion effect. You get those lower frequency resonant frequencies in the, in the ear canal. They get trapped and you hear your voice, you hear yourself. Sometimes it can be good, but some people struggle with their intonation, if, if that's the case. So by having a lower level of attenuation and the air can move both ways, it can, it can stop those uh, lower frequencies getting trapped in the auditory canal. It's called the occlusion effect. Yeah. Brass and woodwind players, I don't think we've got any here, have we? Brass, woodwind, no. Okay, similar thing. They find it difficult to wear, uh, well, cheap earplugs especially. So filter hearing protection advantages, they attenuate, they turn it down, they don't block out the sound. Better frequency response, so you hear the music as it's supposed to be heard. Less occlusion, better communication, still have a conversation with people, especially socially, you're out and about, put your earplugs in, you can still be told that it's your round at the bar. There we are. <laughs> um, music without the muffle, that's what I call it for sure. There we are. So custom, oh, this is, yeah, so you can still hear the music, be in touch with your environment, and increase your exposure time. Simple. Simple. <laughs> so, we will, a few more things to talk about, but we're going to give you a free pair of these, ladies and gentlemen. Whoa. No, that wasn't good enough. We'll have to go to do that again. This is being filmed. All right. So this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, you, we're going to give you a free pair of these earplugs. Well done. We'll cut that one in for sure. Yeah, you're going to get a free pair of these fantastic earplugs. And they actually have the best frequency response in their class. No lie against all other brands, okay? Um, I won't, I don't like to slag off other brands, so I won't, but we have the best one. You're never gonna get, you're never gonna get a flat frequency response with, um, with universal ear plugs, but yeah, the Picato 16 is amazing. And also 16 dB level of attenuation, you know, in most musical environments, louder musical environments, it's plenty. And in social situations, it's fine. So go back to that kind of like 97 decibels, um, okay, you've got half an hour at 97, 16 dB takes you down to 81, so you've gone from half an hour to nearly 16 hours. Right, so it's, 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 it's plenty, plenty, okay, uh, and you can still have a conversation. You, you'd be surprised. Everybody that uses them, you know, straight away, they're like, wow, I expect to be completely blocked out, but, it, you know, it's great. So you're getting a, a good level of protection in most environments. Um, yeah, for sure. And also, we have them in this nice... Uh, we've got them branded up for you, Royal Northern. And they come with a handy little uh, carrying case, uh, like an aluminium tube, so clip them on your key ring, take them out. You, you know, if you get in noisy situations, just pop them in. Uh, so a handy little carrying tube there, um, which is nice. So yeah. So let's just move on quickly to custom. Um, custom fit. They're custom made, bespoke for your ears only. So they're made specifically that will only fit your ears. Um, do you know what, we actually at trade shows, we've had people steal custom earplugs and custom in on a sort of stand. Like, they won't fit your ears. Why did they do that? You can imagine them getting out, yeah, I'll nick these, they were 140 quid. Or, yeah, oh, don't fit. Oh, no, no, that's right. They're made from a soft medical grade silicon, which we're one of the only manufacturers that do that. And high fidelity attenuating filters, the best in the world. Ambient hearing protection, we call it. Uh, advantages, comfortable, soft, hypoallergenic, soft silicon. Actually, as they warm up to your body temperature, they almost kind of dissolve, you don't really realise you're wearing them. But because they fit perfectly to your ears, you can guarantee the fit 
every time. If you can guarantee the fit and the seal integrity, you can guarantee the protection and the frequency response of the attenuating filter and a range of interchangeable filters we have with our ear, hearing protection as well. Yeah, for example, say percussionists, drummers, slightly higher uh, levels of attenuation in the mids and highs, cymbals, hi-hats, snare drums, uh, Pro 17, uh, flat frequency response. But for singers, brass, woodwind, maybe a lower level of attenuation, especially in the mids and low frequencies, so you don't get so much of that occlusion effect. Um, however, for singers, I, I don't know if most of you are going to be singing in classical environments, you, you may not need it, okay? It's, uh, again, it's just being aware of the sound levels in the environments or performance spaces you're, you're working in, for sure. And our Pro 17 is the most natural, or has been hailed as the most natural sounding earplug in the world, uh, with an almost flat frequency response, so it's just like turning the sound down, doesn't adjust the sound at all. Plus with custom, you can have them all different colours, which is nice. And you can have your name laser etched on them, you can have neck cords and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we do also make in-ear monitors, and I think um, vocalists, in your careers, you will come across this using in-ear monitors for sure. Uh, the silent stage and on-stage on monitoring now is going over to in-ear monitors, definitely, so you will come across having to use, use this. Um, they're custom made for yours, fit perfectly, get more isolation, plus very, very high quality speaker driver systems there. And again, we're one of the only manufacturers to make them out of soft silicon, which for singers is very important because as you sing, what happens when you sing and open your mouth, your auditory canal will move. So with ours, the actual in-ear monitor will move and flex as well. So other manufacturers are made from a hard acrylic, so they don't move and you can get a vent, they vent and open or they become uncomfortable over long periods of time. The reason why a lot of people don't make them out of soft silicon is that it's more difficult to make a good quality, good sounding in-ear monitor in soft silicon. Uh, but, but we do it very successfully. Um, uh, I can't tell you how because it's a secret. <laughs> so how do we make a custom mould, a uh, custom mould product? Well we'd have to take a mould of your ear. Um, so we, we sort of uh, syringe in a custard or a, a silicon actually into your ear. We block the ear canal first of all and then um, make a mould of your ears with a, um, a, a, a two-part silicon that has a, a hardener in it. So it sets after about three to five minutes. Then we gently take that model of your ear out of your ear. That goes back to our lab. Scan it with a laser, create a 3D model of your ear and then we 3D print the shell of that, the reverse of it, to make the mould, and then syringe the silicon into it to make the earpiece, and then crack that off like a, like a hard-boiled egg, and then we hand finish it um, and lacquer it. So they're all, they are handmade apart from the 3D printing process. Plus, we have your ears on file in 3D, digitally. <laughs> so, so if you, if you, uh, if you lose your earplugs or whatever, we can just remake them. That's not a problem. So, yeah. Plus, we can we can do this. We can actually use a 3D ear scanner to create a 3D model straight away. Uh, it has its limitations, but for people with very sensitive ears or very narrow ear canals, um, it is good for to do that. So it just creates the 3D model of your ears straight away. The advantage of this as well that I could be anywhere in the world, take a, an ear impression of uh, scan someone's ear drag the file to a Dropbox online and then that, that, that's, in the, that's in the lab into manufacturing straight away. So we do believe at supporting education. To that effect we do, we supply hearing protections for all Northern, but also we do do an exclusive 20% discount on all of our custom products. You can buy our products online. We would then send you a free voucher to get your ear impressions done at a Boots Hearing Care Centre. We work with Boots Hearing Care audiologists uh, and you can have 20% off and that's the code that you use at our online shop, ACS Education 20. Very, very simple, 20% 20, 20 off. So for custom earplugs, they're normally £139, so 20% off is £111. So, but hey, if you value your hearing, it's, it's a worthwhile investment. Just briefly mention about the Musician's Hearing Health Scheme. This um, is a criteria uh, run scheme to provide um, audiometric testing and hearing care and hearing protection for professional musicians. 
So when you leave the Royal Northern, you're working professionally, um, you may be eligible for this scheme to get a hearing test, one-to-one -one consultancy, and also a pair of our custom hearing protection for £40, ladies and gentlemen. Or if you're in the Musicians' Union, £30, which is nice. There we are. Just a couple of light-hearted things to finish off. We did the world's largest sound band um, world record at the Royal Albert Hall in 2014. Gosh, it's five years. Um, 1,700, just under 1,700 children all wearing these Picatos playing samba. And they could still hear all the instructions, but they were protecting their hearing, which was great. We had Blue Peter there, and it was, it was, was loud, for sure. And then we, more recently, we did the world's largest drum lesson, um, and had 2,000 children wearing these earplugs. Again, they could hear, um, hear all the instructions they needed um, for, for that lesson. And we got the world's uh, world record for that, and that's my daughter there holding the certificate for the world record. Yeah, bless her. So, what should you be doing? Well, I think, really, from this presentation, a bit like alcohol awareness, drug awareness, cyber security, all that sort of stuff, is just being aware, yeah? And especially being aware for sound levels and, uh, in the environments that you're in, especially socially and recreationally. If you are working with amplified s stuff, you know, especially vocalists, uh, you may be working with some of the, the, the in the, uh, the rock and pop stuff. You know, in rehearsals, you don't have to have it very loud so you know be bold ask people to turn down do you know what I mean do you need it that loud for a rehearsal you know it's your hearing that's getting damaged as well as everybody else's wear your hearing protection you know use these take them out socially recreationally um, and if you feel you're in a noisy environment pop them in um, and I would say don't keep quiet about any problems that you think you have speak to a, a doctor get referred on to an audiologist or go into a high street audiologist and get your ears checked out because yeah, you know, this is one of the most important assets you have as a musician, and you only have one pair of ears. And there's Big Ears saying that. I don't know how Big Ears talks. How does he... Do you know this character? Yeah. How did he... How, what did he sound like? You only have one pair of ears. Maybe not like that. More information. Um, you will come across these people with your... I think there's two modules that you're going to be doing in... Um, Health and Wellbeing for Musicians, which is fantastic. That's the first time, I think, at the Royal Northern, or maybe, actually, I think any other HE music institution will be doing this, which is fantastic. It's the British Society, the British Association for Performing Arts Medicine uh, about health and wellbeing for musicians. So that's everything from diet, musculoskeletal problems, warming up, repetitive strain injuries, all sorts, hearing, everything. Fantastic. British Tennis Association, fantastic people. They have support groups that you can go along and talk about problems if you have any concerns about tinnitus. And they also have a helpline you can phone up. The same as Help Musicians UK have a helpline for musicians, not only just for various uh, medical concerns, but also um, if you have any uh, sort of uh, more emotional or mental health problems that you want to talk about or stress about being a performing musician, they have a helpline um, called Music Minds Matters and uh, you can talk to somebody um, about your problems or share your problems with somebody that actually can sympathise and actually understand what you're, what you're going through. Really lovely people. Um, so Help Musicians UK, yeah, brilliant. So if you're serious about sound, you really need to play safe now so you can still hear tomorrow. So thank you very much for your time. Um, you can hit me up on social media if you want, or you can email me if you've got any other questions.